Hey everyone, my name is Dave Schools. I'm the founder of Entrepreneur's Handbook, a medium publication dedicated to helping entrepreneurs succeed. I started the publication six years ago, founded around the mission of just telling inspirational startup stories with practical takeaways. And now as the publication has grown to over 200,000 followers, it's quite the community. And so we wanted to take our storytelling to the next level and introduce, which I'm very excited about, the first episode of the Entrepreneur's Handbook Show. Today, we have an exciting guest uh, joining us, uh, someone I haven't actually met uh, in person. We've, we've caught each other on Clubhouse a couple of times, um, but it's my pleasure to introduce to you the co-founder and CEO of The Meat Group, Jeff Cook. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Dave. How's it going? Glad. Thank you for having me. For sure. Yeah. Great to, uh, great to be here with you. Uh, I'm excited for all that we're going to talk about. Uh, today. Yeah, now I'm a big fan of Entrepreneur's Handbook. You probably know I've submitted a, a few posts over the years to that. So. I've seen them, and uh, Ev Williams also has has read them. CEO no, of right. and, and <laughs> that's, that's, my, uh, that's my only claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> my mine too, and it's. I mean, I, I love publishing your stories. You, uh, your headline on Medium is you started and sold a ten million dollar company, fifty million dollar company, and a five hundred million dollar company. So. That's what I'd love to uh, to start with and kind of get your background, your story. And we probably could spend three hours on it, but I'm curious if you could give me the three minute version. Sure. Um, so I guess going back all the way to 1997 was when I first started my, my first business. I was a dorm room at Harvard. Um, did um, I, I was looking for, for some way of not having a, uh, you know, regular job or having to clean the toilets of my classmates. And so um, started editing um, essays, resumes, put myself out online. Eventually that would become a multi-million dollar business. Um, after that, I, I, I sold that one, um, started looking for something else. I got into social networking in 2004, 2005 uh, with a company called My Yearbook. I sold that in 2011. Um, then kind of in 2013, came back into that business, re redid everything around an app called Meet Me, um, built a portfolio of apps, uh, 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 Meet Me, Scout, Tagged, Lavu, Growler, um, meeting dating apps with 4 million plus daily active users. And uh, the, the big thing that we, we did that was successful was in 2016, we, we got into live streaming video early um, and, and started applying it to dating use cases and um, started putting the live streaming platform that we built, not only on all of our owned and operated apps, but also making it available as a platform, as a service play to uh, other large public companies, um, Spark Networks, there's another very large dating company that you probably think of. Um, and they, they use that um, to, to, to power some of their apps and experiences. And so that's that's been what we've been really focused on lately is extending kind of our platform through this video platform as a service business. Gotcha. How many uh, how many employees are you at now? Um, you know, I, I guess the the meat group is north of north of three hundred. Gotcha. And you took the company public, is that right? What's that What's that like? We went public in an interesting way in twenty eleven. Um, we, we it was more or less like a reverse merger into a. So it wasn't exactly that, but but we were like ninety five percent of the revenue, and and so it, it was kind of like uh, the old. It was like a spac before it was cool, <laughs> but not quite. It wasn't really that, but it but it has the same effect. You merge into a, something approaching a shell, and um, and that's how we went public. Is that something you'd recommend to others, or what did you learn from going public in that experience? Yeah, um, would I recommend that? That's an interesting question. I, I would say at the time we, we did a pretty careful process, right? So we had, we had hired bankers and we had been all around the world and I felt like that was the only exit really. I had a pretty good certainty on that. And so um, what I liked about it was we did it with the thought of on the other side, using the public currency vehicle to to acquire competitors. Um, and 
it turned out that, that um, you know, the, I think the stock dropped pretty, pretty precipitously do i think mostly the market reasons in like 13 and and so, so it, it, it was difficult to actually do that and so uh you know it's very noisy being the ceo of a public company people are bothering you um quite quite it, it, from all all sides right you have um short sellers you have um activist investors uh, and still all about growth at the end of the day you just need to grow but um there's a lot more noise uh, even just employees who follow the stock price and can get motivated or de demotivated by by ups and downs, and so it's noisy. But at the same time, there's there's some clear pros, right? Like uh, access to capital markets was super easy, right? So like when we we needed to raise um, ultimately almost two hundred million dollars to to acquire some of the companies we did along the way, it was trivial, right? Like I mean, it wasn't quite that easy, but it was almost that easy to to, to raise. Because um, we we but and we we weren't like a high flyer, right? We, but we had real revenue in EBITDA, and it, it would have been harder for us to raise uh, at that time on the private markets because we weren't a high flyer, so we weren't a venture investment. But we had easy access to capital markets, and so we were able to to starting in 2016 actually start um, consolidating um, the dating apps we were interested in. It, it, it took a little longer. Like I, I think we thought we would do this in 2011 and start start doing that right away. But then there was a, a gap between public and private valuation expectations where um, the public just couldn't match the private. And it took about five years for that to uh, come back into uh, deal making territory. And then we were very quick with deal making. We did we did four deals in three years. Right on. What advice would you give to someone, to an entrepreneur or a founder thinking about taking their company public? Um, you know, I would say one of the more important things to do is to imagine the noise level that shorts can can create right so um think about how and and, and I, i've said this before I, I i think about the difference between a long investor and a short investor is, as a long investor bets on the horse to win and a short investor tries to trip the horse right <laughs> so yeah. it's a very active and short investor and um, to the point where they will spend millions of dollars um, with on their own narrative of your company, contacting your important vendors and partners and customers, um, contacting media, right? All to try to get the stock to, to go down, which would then lead people to um, other investors to, to potentially say, oh, there must be some truth to this, this, this narrative. And then it causes it to go down further. And so, it, it's very um, it's very noisy, and I would say, if you're, you have to have your ducks in the row to be able to deal with, you know, short that sort of short attack to really make it worthwhile. I, I, I would say that we we were extraordinarily good, as it turned out, at kind of being on the ropes and taking <laughs> blow after blow and not go down. Um, but it's a it's an un you know it's not exactly the, the space you want to be in. Um, but we, we were good at reacting in the moment. And I think if you're getting ready to go public, you know, take that year, year and a half uh, before that and, and try to t think of every weakness you have and how the, the worst person in the world might exploit it. And, and, and then try to have a, a, a strategy to, for, for, for that, that, that you, can, you can live with. As you've looked at, like in the past uh, with your, the past startups that you've worked on, what would you say is more important for a startup, the data or the story? Data or storytelling? When yeah. you're building a startup, which one would you say founders should rely on more or look to, look to build up more? It's kind of like you're putting your marketing hat on. Yeah. What would you say is more important? You know, I've been described in the past as kind of a, a, a meat and potatoes guy as it relates to this stuff. So, so like that, that would naturally make you think data. Right. So, so like at the end of the day, investors are investing in uh, the data and, and, and like is, is your you have to then take that data and, and tell a story with it. So so they're they're related to each other. But um, at, at the earliest day, obviously, all you have is story. Um, but, you know, people generally need a narrative to believe in. Right. Like so. So you, I do spend a lot of time thinking about 
what that narrative is um, as it relates to the different projects that you're going out with. So I, it's, it's hard to divorce data from story because really you do need the story and the data needs to support the story. And obviously your story is a lot better if you can show an inflecting graph, right? Like it, then, then your storytelling is kind of easy. Um, but I, I would say one of the things that I think you could always do better is, you know, what is that brand story? Why should it exist? Um, you know, right now we're, we're in this video platform as a service business. It's actually a really easy story to tell, right? Like dating apps are more or less topping out, right? Like they're very hyper competitive space. Um, and at the same time, they're, they're not going anywhere. It's not like they're going away. But, um, you know, the, the day of just selling more and more subscriptions over and over again, right? Th those days are for the most part behind you as far as, you know, the growth. And so you're going to find your growth in other ways. And, 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 and so that like, that's, that's the story kind of we're telling today. Um, if, if, if you then go back down into the app level for one of our apps and say, well, what's the story that meet me is telling, right? It's, it's a story about meeting new people connecting. Um, but that's a harder story, right? Because that's a story that many others are telling, right? And so, the more unique your hook, right, um, the better. Um, and and it, there, there's that, uh, who says it? It, it, it? There's a there's a song called Hook that's done by um, some famous musician. And he, he, he sings in, in an inflected voice, but he doesn't say anything. And that's his point. He's basically saying the, the hook is everything. Um, actually, I, I actually was listening to this recently. It's by um, Blues Traveler, but you know, it doesn't matter what I say, so long as I sing with inflection, right? And and, and huh. concludes that the hook brings you back on that you can rely. Um, and and so like I, I think of it in those terms. Like if, if you don't have a good hook, you're going to be in the weeds for a, kind of a long, a long time just struggling. Um, and your hook might start off good and then go away, right? That's another way to think about a hook is kind of a growth loop or a you know, and, and sometimes those, those loops, you know, break down over because of changing circumstances. But um, I, I, I think if you look at the dating market today, yeah, you, had, you have obviously Bumble and Tinder at the top with Bumble, you know, having a really interesting female centric hook and Tinder being the first to really do the swipe uh, really simply and well. And so, you know, those are very straightforward hooks. Um, Hinge, you know, has a pretty straightforward hook designed to be deleted really for relationship minded um, and telling that story in a crystal clear way, way that can be more or less like five to 10 words. That's, that's, that's kind of the hook, right? Like that's, that's the reason you're going to tell somebody to go get this app. Um, and, and so if I'm, if I'm thinking about an app or business to build today, like I would think in those terms, like what, what is the hook? Cause like it, at the end of the day, that's, that's kind of, kind of narrative story, that's obviously part and parcel of the hook, but if, if the hook isn't a hook, then it's not going to work. And, and so the data is obviously telling you if your hook is working. Let me, uh, let me try and, and uh, recap or uh, give the story of the, of the meat group and uh, correct me where I'm wrong, because there's, there's an interesting uh, future, I think ahead that, that you've been writing about. And that's uh, in the, in the, the crowded industry of the dating market, you have these big players that you just that you just mentioned. Uh, the Meet Group is providing the software, the app underneath that powers dating experiences with a video first uh, proposition. And you talk, you've, you've written about live streaming as kind of what's going to fix a lot of the problems that we see in the dating world. Uh, I'm curious where where you see the dating industry going and how live streaming is is impacting that. Yeah, and so I think where where the dating industry is going is um, expanding its kind of footprint to go beyond just you know uh, finding people to that that are attractive to look at and then swiping as many of those and playing this numbers game to get up, get some chats and then and meet some people in in real life, right? And for a long time, I think even people that work at dating companies they were just wholly focused on the dating app as utility, right? The dating app is only there to make you find uh, a date for a spouse you know, for, for, for some future period. And 
if you add, and, and Eugene Way has, has written eloquently on this in, in an essay called Status as a Service, but, but, but if you add to that, uh, instead of just utility and competing on who's the best utility, but you also add some entertainment value, it's, it's actually really interesting because there's entertainment and utility in a dating context can't actually be separated from each other, right? Because there, there are entertainment experiences that are that are themselves providing some form of utility. And an example of this is you're, um, you, you come to a dating app, maybe feeling lonely, maybe feeling like, like connecting to someone, finding a date. Um, and yes, you know, you, you could just send out a lot of outbounds and hope for some inbounds. But if you could right then just get into a, a chat with somebody in, in a live stream, it could be a one to many, it could be few to many, but you're, you're actually watching something happening live you can interact through comments or other ways with the, or, or by joining the stream. Um, you know, suddenly um, you, you feel less lonely. And, and we, we've seen this in our own studies, like the user feels less lonely and they feel more entertained. And, you know, there, there's a certain amount of utility that comes from, you know, feeling less lonely in a dating app, right? Like that, that's kind of the point. Um, and, and entertainment helps fill some of that void, but obviously it's in this context of social entertainment. And so I think, you're going to see the the giant dating companies all get into areas that are, um, uh, you know, uh, getting into more streaming and more 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 real time uh, engagements. And, and obviously, with um, the virus and and hopefully now towards the tail end, at least in the United States uh, of of the pandemic, you're 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 going to you're going to see some of this change behaviors because. You know, I think you look at Bumble and you look at some others, and and, and they're saying very clearly that um, you know people now expect to video chat before they meet in real life. Which, of course, um, that 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 could be for for multiple reasons, but including for the utility of not meeting somebody for coffee for the first time and finding out you'd really rather not spend a single minute with them, right? <laughs> um, and so, if you could do that it, from the comfort of your home and in a more efficient way, then why wouldn't you? And I think pre-pandemic, it was a little strange to have to put everybody through a video chat, but it's not that way anymore. And and, and so I think real-time experiences um, are are gonna are gonna be all all over dating. And I think dating will generally, if you look at some of the moves Match has made recently, like they bought HyperConnect, uh, a large, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think it was Korean-based uh, streaming company that has a, a an app called Azar, which is kind of one-to-one. Uh, video experiences, um, you know, I think I think you're going to see a lot of um, a, a lot of attention paid to kind of these markets that are outside of maybe e e U.S. And, and and North America and and Europe, but also these new ways of potentially engaging people. Now that you're kind of in this post-pandemic um, world where people are now very accustomed to um, streaming, but at the same time. You know now you can actually meet up and so um you know how do you then play that as best as possible and, and so i think it's I, I you know i think the i think pandemic you know it definitely did a lot to to make dating companies realize they're actually more than utility dating companies um yeah there there's they're something a lot more there jeff i'm curious to, to get your thoughts on live streaming but applied to brands live streaming we've seen is one of the most effective ways to share an authentic story. You know, it's like we're live, it's real, uh, mm -hmm. not hiding anything. That that is that's great in the in the dating experience. But then as brands start to adopt live streaming, there's something that I've encountered in, in conversations with marketers where they they mentioned this idea of brand risk that live streaming, like something could go wrong, our, our Wi-Fi drops, something with a guest's you know, video or, or where they are, like any number of things can go wrong with live streaming. And a, and a tool like StreamYard, of course, helps with, with stabilizing and removing those factors. Right. But live streaming as a video strategy, do you think we're going to see that increase going forward in the future? Or how, how would you see brands starting to use live streaming more? And do you mean brands enabling video inside their experiences or brands streaming out as the brand? Either yeah. one, it sounds interesting. Yeah, so, so, I, so I, think, um, I think one of the things that I've seen people get more accustomed to just in our own live streaming environment is 
there's this expectation that the service is going to do everything it can to try to keep things safe, right? So you're going to have moderation. You're going to do, you know, algorithmic nudity prevention in more or less real time, right? You're 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 going to have some way of algorithmically looking at comments and things like that. And at the same time, I think that people expect that humans are uh, flawed creatures who occasionally do bad things and often do. And, and, and I think people are, are, are used to, you know, if you see something happen in, in, a, in, a, in a, an environment and then it's quickly removed, you know, I, I, I think people just expect to see things like that. Um, now, you, you might say, well, it would be better to not see any of that. And, and of course, that, that, that would be better. But, um, you know, in order to have none of that, you kind of have to, at least at the moment, kind of sacrifice the real time nature of the of the conversation. And I think that's too much to sacrifice. Right. Um, because that that's what makes it interesting. And I think, um, you know, streaming in particular allows for connection and vulnerability that, you know, if you look at a dating app, you know, dating apps, at least traditionally, they, they kind of connect you around something that most people don't even think is the most important thing, right? Like it's just about appearance in a dating app for the most part, right? I'm just going to swipe through at the most attractive people. That's all I'm, all I'm able to judge is the photo. So that's all I can deal with. Um, and, and that's not how like real world experiences actually operate. Yeah, attraction is one element, but sense of humor, you know, uh, uh, voice, tone, uh, body language. I mean, th 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 there's a lot more. And, and of course, video is able to, to capture that. But both video when it's recorded or, vi or video in live, you know, is able to at least give you a better sense of, of who a person is. And, and so I think, I, I think there's just been, there's clearly been a trend toward authenticity with, it, with respect to, to dating for some time. And it's not really just dating, right? It's really across the internet, like right? yeah. authenticity in these interactions. People you get verified profiles. They do all sorts of things. Blue check marks. Um, they try to say, "Look, I am who I am." Um, but video and, and you know, or streaming in any way is one of the best ways of kind of interacting, right? Like it would be hard for 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 a robot to emulate this conversation, at least today, right? Like that, that, that's yeah. that's difficult. And so you, I think people have been craving that sort of um, experience, and and I think. Now you have these product developers who now have all the infrastructure that they needed, right? You have real-time platforms like Agora and others, you know, presence prop platforms like PubNub and others. And now you could build on top of all of these things and create these really interesting innovations that I think uh, we'll, we'll see more and more of. Something we've noticed on the, the Hop Inside of virtual events uh, platform is when creating these experiences, there's kind of two decisions that an event producer has to make. One, do we pre-record and make it polished, professional, you know, mm -hmm. kind of as perfect as possible, and then stream it in, and we're hands off, worry free, yeah. or do we go live and be live in the event, you know, where we're in the moment, uh, things may go wrong, there might be an internet connection, there might be blurriness, you know, like there are little small hiccups here and there, um, but it's a more genuine in the moment experience. Yeah. With those two decisions, one thing that we've noticed is that if it's a polished pre-recorded event, attendees and viewers can pick up on the fact that it's pre-recorded and the level of, I don't want to say criticism or uh, mm. like uh, not judgment, but but because it's they're just watching television, essentially, you know, like uh, just watching something, they're more free to comment. Uh, mm. Whereas if it's live streaming, they're involved. The chat changes from like this external viewing experience to involved in the conversation, like going off of what people are saying in the panel. Right. Um, so that's that's something that's that's kind of interesting. We've noticed that that a lot of successful events do a combination of both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that makes a, a ton of sense. I, I think people have this willingness to accept some flaws from their live experiences, whereas a produced experience, um, you know, a produced experience clearly has its its play too, depending on what you're what you're looking for. Um, and so like something that I, I've heard said before, which I think is reasonable, is like synchronish, right? Like um, mm. have the real time experience, but have some way of taking asynchronous um, experiences too, right? Yeah. And I think maybe somewhere in the middle there 
is, 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 is you know, or, or some combination of synchronous and asynchronous is where you find magical products. As I, as I delve deeper and deeper into the live streaming world, I'm, I'm noticing, especially how enterprise companies use live streaming, often they're not, you know, broadcasting and multi-streaming to their, you know, large social channels, but they're yeah. broadcasting into like a Facebook group or a closed community mm -hmm. or an unlisted YouTube group where, you know, they're partners or their membership or, you know, it's like it's, it's more of a closed door experience that's more intimate. And more yeah. authentic, and then that's that's where the medium of live streaming really makes sense, yeah. as opposed to like kind of the the professional broadcasting where it's overly rehearsed and scripted. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. I mean, as as far as live streaming strategies go, I mean, I think uh, you know being authentic. So if, if you're what live tends to work when you get a sense that the person that you're you're watching flawed or, or not, you know, is at least being themselves, right? And so when they're not being themselves or, or they're, you know, they're not sure what they're authorized to say, um, you know, that, that, that are, that's probably not a great situation. Um, and so if a brand, I can see how a brand could potentially overthink it. But, you know, if you, if you have people who can, can speak kind of authentically for a brand and, you know, we, ha we have a, a number of brands um, in, our, in our portfolio, you know, finding those people is not easy um, who can speak authentically and represent a brand and its values. But that that is important, right? Like if you can, you, you, every brand kind of needs its one spokesperson um, who can, who, who you can marshal out and they can be themselves and they represent the brand. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's, let me ask you a question that Entrepreneur's Handbook was founded upon. And it was the question, how do you turn an idea into income? It might be a simple question, but everybody has business ideas, right? But then how do you translate that into cash in your hand? And this could be on a small scale or a large scale, but this is the kind of thinking that an entrepreneur has. And I'm curious uh, the way that that strikes you, that question, the best way to turn an idea into income. Yeah. Um... I mean, if you just go back to my own story, I guess, you know, my first idea was, you know, 1997 internet e-commerce, you know, sell the only thing I knew how to do, which was write and edit. Um, and so that was a really straightforward connection. I basically said, well, look, what can I do now? If I were to do something like that, you know, there's a lot more competition. The internet isn't young, right? Like it, it, it's harder, but, but at least at, at that time that I was very much just, just trying to take something I knew how to do and, and, and apply it. I, I, I would say in kind of going from idea to income, I, I generally now think about leverage, right? So like in, in the first example, the, the editing business or the writing business, um, unless I'm doing, unless I have a bunch of editors and eventually I did in the early days though, I was doing all of the editing writing. Obviously that doesn't scale. You know, you, you, you don't, you don't have any leverage. You, you need to make money essentially when, um, when you know the, the when you're sleeping, right? Like people have to be able to con use your products all the time, um, and so you know I think that that that's why I think you see so many network effects businesses, right? Because if you can now, I would think of idea to money in the pocket. You know, I I probably don't think about necessarily if I'm trying to start something new, like how is this going to make money right now? Like there's certain contexts where where I do think that's really important, but in a networks effects business, it's not really that important, right? Like the, the first thing is, can you get, in the case of my yearbook, uh, can you get enough people on the network to have anything there that, that, that where they can meet each other? And if you can, then there's there's value from the network effect because the more people that come in, there's more people to meet, uh, creating more value. And then then you can always potentially find ads, subscription, IAPs, some way of, of monetizing them. But, but the, the fundamental problem is, can you amass them? And so um, I, I guess for a, a service business, you know, it, it's a little more direct, but um, idea to income, then when you're like a platform as a service play or a SaaS play, um, there are cases where I, I think first about the income, right? So it's like, okay, I have this thing. I have this distribution point. I'm able to reach these companies that we serve with our SDKs. Um, I know that they don't particularly care about what my next engagement feature is. They, what they probably care more about is if they can get 
an extra that ten thousand dollars a day by flipping a switch because everybody will try that, right? Um, and so, you know, th there I, 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 I'm thinking more like, well, how do I create an experience that's going to not only engage but monetize because I know that's the only way I'll get the distribution I need, and I've built in distribution because of the the SDK relationship. So, I, I, I think it as as far as going from kind of a an idea to income. I think you have to know where the future income is um, that you're trying to, to get. And, and in the case of consumer social, you're probably best off not worrying too much about the yeah. income up, up front um, and just trying to build network scale. That, that reminds me of things, right? it's different. the question that we, we asked at, at Hoppin in, in the earlier days, or at least last year, was in making a strategic decision, are we optimizing for growth or for revenue? And right. to your point, in the early days of a, a flywheel effect, you know, viral growth product optimizing for growth was always the answer. Always, right. Because, um, you know, once you start optimizing for EBITDA, you're going to have an EBITDA multiple valuation, right? And so you better be sure that's what you want um, because because th that, that's a much harder business, right? Like that, that's a real business, first of all. Right. But, but it's, um, you know, you're going to go from nosebleed multiples on a growth story but again, if, if all you have at the end of the day is a growth story, then then obviously there's a, a point at which yeah. like, it probably slows. And then you're, you, you do have to envision what your business is really going to be um, when, when, that, when that slows. Yep. But, but you know, if you could keep kicking that down the line because you're growing so fast, that's what you'd like to do. Totally. Let me, uh, let me ask you this question because this, this comes up a lot in, uh, in conversations with uh, at least younger entrepreneurs or earlier stage entrepreneurs with um, how do you know when to pull the plug and walk away from a venture? Like, you know, in a world like ours today, the amount of opportunity and things and projects we could chase and work on and all the income streams we can develop. When do you know, especially if you strike mediocre success, how do you know when you should pull the plug and not focus energy on a venture anymore? Uh, that's a tough one, right? Because because it, it's a uh, yeah, or, or maybe you're asking the wrong person. Because <laughs> like it, it, I, I've been more or less connected to to things, and, and you know, I, I guess to some extent, you know, I, I sold the company, but I, I continue to run it. Um, so I, I mean, but as as to when to actually step away, I, I, I would say, you know, when. You, if, if you don't actually have um, an idea on how to kind of push forward to growth, I mean, that, that's a natural time, right? Like if, if you don't believe that you're the best person to keep moving the growth engine along, that's kind of the, yeah. the, 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 the probably the right time. But I, I, I think the reality is most entrepreneurs because they're so wedded in the weeds of the products they've built, um, you know, they, they always stay too long <laughs> yeah. and, and, and that's, that's the nature of it. Right. I, I think that's, that's fine to, to, to some extent, but um, you know, I, I think it, it would be hard to say when, you know, I, you could make it as, as simple as well when, when you're not having fun anymore, but that that's baloney, right? Like, cause most of it's not fun, right? Like, like right. I've been doing this for a long time. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's probably more about the future, right? Like, so it's, if, if you don't see how this thing continues to grow, um, you know, that, that's probably a good time to go. And, and if you look, if I, if I look at my own backstory, like I've been doing this for a long time, but even, you know, my yearbook in 2005, um, all the way to 2021, they're more or less the same company. It's kind of different evolutions and different phases, but I, I find it, it really interesting to have these different phases, right? So like in the beginning of my yearbook, it was super fun and interesting, right? Uh, 2005, 2006, venture capital, all that. Um, two couple different um, uh, series A, series B, Silicon Valley. Then, 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 then in like 2011, it was the public company phase, which had its own issues and things to learn. Um, and, um, and, 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 and all sorts of, of, of challenges, but, um, then in, in 2016, it became this new product, this, this video thing. Um, and so I, I tend to think like every five to seven years, you're probably doing something that's so different. It's not like you're, you're ever doing the same thing for 15 or 20 years. You, you, you might have these different chapters. Um, and 
I, I probably, you know, I, I've, I've not really walked away because I've, I keep seeing the next chapter, yeah. <laughs> but, but I guess if you stop seeing the next chapter, that might be the time. Right on. What, uh, you could take this in any, any direction, uh, you want, uh, but I'm curious, uh, what is the myth you find yourself dispelling often? Um, yeah, I mean, a, a myth that I dispel often. You know, I, I, I think it, it, it depends on the co constituency, right? So, so I, I think if you're, you know, if you, if you wear your, your my, my old public company hat, right, and, and what you would, see, and you might talk to a lot of investors, and, and I think you will often get investors who invest in companies, but they don't really, under, especially in a public company, but, but they don't really understand anything about the business. And, and they might even be substantial investors in, in, in the company. Um, and it can be easy for somebody with an investor hat on to have made the wrong bet somewhere along the way. And, and, and they, they view kind of this, this business as um, kind of a, like a bond or like a, you know, an annuity that just, okay, even the margins are 40%. Yeah. You know, like, just run, grow revenue ten percent every year. That's all you got to do, um, and and so um, as opposed to I think as as any entrepreneur would see, like you're you're in this hyper competitive space with any number of different you know you're you're you're, you're, you're juggling different grenades in the air and you know and hoping that, that they don't explode, and, and so you know I I think um, I, I I think sometimes it, it's difficult to 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 take somebody who, who might have the wrong thesis, might, might be involved in the company, but not really understand it, um, and then try to see eye to eye, because that's often where you don't, like that's where you might get an activist problem or, or, or other issue, because you know, you, you, at least in a public company, you're, you're never really gonna speak, uh, you, you're under no obligation to tell them how the company's doing, other than your, your quarterly reporting obligations. And so you, you never disabuse this person of, you know, their, their incorrect notions because you, you don't want to turn them into a seller. It doesn't help anybody. Um, and um, sometimes though, when, when, when that divide is so big, what you do is, is you bring them inside of the company and, and put them or, or a representative of them, put them on the board so that you can actually say, well, look, look at all these other things that we're, we're thinking about. And, you know, like here, there's this bigger picture it's not as simple as, as, as you might think, but I, I, I would say pro probably that. I, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I think that's probably it. I see. Uh, I see a lot of books behind you. Uh, what is uh, the book that you recommend most to startup people or entrepreneurs or, or business folks? Yeah, you know, I just recommended um, a book by the Disney. Uh, I think the ride of a lifetime. I can't, it's, it's up here somewhere. Uh, ride of a lifetime. Oh yeah. Uh, by Bob Iger. And uh, what's, what's great about that book is um, it was a Disney CEO um, for a long time, very successful, but, but he, he came in as the Disney COO um, and um, he, he was a long time um, C, COO under Iger. And, and he, he basically, um, and, and the company was doing poorly at that time. And, and so it was hard for him to get the role because he was conceived of as being of the old guard and Disney wanted to change. And so hiring the COO didn't seem like the greatest idea in the world, but he managed to basically get the job anyway um, by kind of just having a forward looking vision of what he would do and having it be very, very crystallized. Um, and he, uh, you know, I think importantly he says, and it sounds trite, but I don't think it is, you know, you need to, when you talk about the company, you have to be able to say, you know, the three pillars, right? And it doesn't super matter what you, I mean, it does matter what the three pillars are. They, they should actually, you know, relate to, to, the, to the company, but um, you can't have four, <laughs> right? And, and you can't have five, right? And, 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 and I, I think this is actually a really interesting way of, of thinking about a young business or an old business, like a, an, a you know, business that's been around 20 years or, or a business that, 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 that is just being started. Like, what are your, your, your three pillars? And, mm. you know, in, in the case of uh, Disney, it was clear, you know, his first pillar was content, um, which of course, uh, 
make sense. But but like he 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 knew that back then, and um, he he continued to um, you know you know, and and then the other two pillars that he had were were kind of around I think distribution related to internationalizing that content, and the other was kind of distribution around you know the technology to to make better content. And so you know, I, but I like that that phraseology because like if you could get into situations where like a, a Yahoo, remember the CEO of Yahoo, I'm sure she's great, but, but at one point she, she completely blew the, the answer to what is Yahoo, right? Like, um, and, and so like, if you, if you can't say what it is your company does, um, you know, you probably shouldn't be running it. Right. Oh. And so if, but if, if you only have three pillars, it makes it easy to, to answer the question when someone asks it, what, what is it that you do? And, just come back to the three things that hopefully you've said, you know, a hundred times. Yeah. At, uh, at StreamYard, Gage and Dan are the co-founders and they've, since the beginning of the company, young company, uh, less than, it's about two years old and just sold to Hoppin for $250 million earlier yeah. this year in like less than two years. But something that's, that, uh, that uh, is true of Gage and Dan is that they've had those, those three pillars since the beginning. And Dan, who, who heads kind of the, the engineering side of the company, says that if you wake up any StreamYard video engineer in the middle of the night and shake them and point an, a, a light in their eyes and ask them, like, what are the three pillars of StreamYard? <laughs> they know it right off the, off the top of your head. Gage says it at the beginning of every town hall every Sunday. Mm-hmm. And they just through repetition, like, that's it embodies the, the product. Ease of use, reliability, and professional streams. Like, I even know it. Yeah. Because uh, I've heard it so many yeah. times. But, yeah, that's a... Great point about can you distill what your company is, no, no matter how big or how small it is, into three pillars. That's right. a great takeaway. Uh, Jeff, we have three minutes left. I have three questions I want to I want to ask you. Um, feel free to spend a lot of time on them or not a lot. Uh, it's it's kind of uh, there's two binary questions, and uh, one is throughout your life, which has served you more, discipline or passion? I think discipline has probably served me more. Um, you know, I think uh, I think passion. I think there's there's times that you're passionate, um, and but I, I think it's the showing up every day that that probably serves you more. Yeah, you don't always feel you know on or like super passionate. You know, in, in right, every moment. right. So. And a lot of times those passions could hurt you too. Like if you're too passionate, you know that that could be. Um, that, you know, it could be used against you. How about this one? Obsession or balance? It's kind of a similar, similar question, but asked it in a, a different way. What, what contributes to success better being obsessed or being balanced? Yeah. Um, I, I think it would be hard to, uh, create products if you're not obsessed. Right. So like, it's just a nature, the nature of, uh, of product uh, development is it's obsessive. It's the details, it's the weeds, it's the, it's the funnel, it's the metrics. Um, and so at the same time, like you don't want to burn out. And so, you know, I, like, I, I, I do think you, you need obsession um, in order to do anything probably interesting, but then there, there also has to be some structures of balance and, and you could have structures of balance from, you know, eating dinner with your family, having a workout routine. Um, I, I think those sorts of things help structuring your day, your calendar. Um, but at the end of the day, like if you're not obsessed in some, at some level with what you're doing, it's probably not because you're probably not creating anything interesting. It's a great point. I like what you said at the beginning with, uh, if you're building products, you need to be obsessed. It's kind of like a prerequisite to your point, create anything necessary. Um, Let's do uh, this question. So I, I, uh, I have Party Cues, which is a conversation starter app. The first question, if you Google questions app, it comes up and as the number one result. Okay. Um, the question that kicked off Party Cues uh, five years ago, very first question, um, one that I love asking people is what makes you feel most alive? Hmm. What makes you feel most alive? You know, I, I think... Uh, one of it, it's my my fortress of solitude is uh, Lake George, New York. I have a place up there and um, on the lake, 
and just jumping off of a boat into the lake is yeah. the greatest thing, right? It never gets old. It, it, it you know, um, the kit well, lake could be cold. Lake, lake George, I've been going to Lake George since I was born. My family goes oh, really? there every year for the past, since my dad was a kid, like 67 years. Oh, wow. I'm going there in, in a couple of weeks, actually. Lake George is the gold I'm going standard there for today. water. <laughs> Right yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, with the, the, the mountains and, and the, the, the blue lake and the, the green. So, so, so I, you know, I think getting into nature, uh, just taking a walk, you know, I, even even here, uh, I live in Princeton, you know, being able to to, to just take a walk or a hike. Like th that's where I, I think I probably feel best. Amazing. Yeah. I couldn't pick a better spot than Lake George, New York. That's that's gorgeous. Um, all right, Jeff, any any last thoughts? Where can people find you, learn more about you? I think you have you have quite the story and, and we, we only touched we're able to touch on it a little bit today, but really appreciate you sharing your insights. Where can people find out more about you? Yeah, no, I appreciate the chance to chat with you and congrats on all your success as well. I mean, it, that story is phenomenal. But uh, I mean, Twitter is probably, you know, Jeff Cook. Uh, it's with a G, G-E-O-F-F-C-O-O-K -O -O or uh, Clubhouse. I'm on Jeff Cook, too. Um, on on medium you'll find actually a, a number of entrepreneur handbook uh, posts on my medium which is also jeff.cook amazing thanks jeff talk to you later cheers all right take care thank you hey if you're still watching really quick if you have a story that you'd like to share Send it on over to Entrepreneur's Handbook. The email is here below. Uh, take a, We'll take a look at it. And if it's a good fit, we can publish your story. Also, if you or someone you know would be a great fit to come on uh, onto the Entrepreneur's Handbook show as a guest, I'd love to chat with them. I know I asked some pretty random questions, but uh, we I love going deeper behind just the success story and learning more about who entrepreneurs are as people. Thanks for watching. See you next time.